Hello, my name is Marnie and I'd like to welcome you to Frankston City Library's Frank Talk with internationally best-selling author Matthew Riley. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which Frankston City Libraries operates, the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. I'd also like to extend that acknowledgement to the elders of any other communities who may be joining us today. Now, let's be honest, I actually don't know that Matthew Riley needs any introduction tonight. He, but I have to. So he is the internationally best-selling author of the Scarecrow novels, the Jack West novels, and the standalone novels Contest, Temple, Hover Car Racer, The Tournament, Troll Mountain, The Great Zoo of China, and The Secret Runners of New York. His books are published in over 20 languages with worldwide sales of over 7 million copies. Matthew's latest release, The Two Lost Mountains, is the next, next instalment of, the, of Jack West's adventures. Matthew is joining us all the way from Los Angeles, California tonight. Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Marnie. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming along. It's great to be here. It's so lovely to have you. And I'm, I must say, I'm really conscious that we do have people joining us from the UK and the USA tonight. And they, have, they don't actually receive the book until January. So I'm going to be really careful with my questions about the two Lost Mountains. Okay? I promise everyone that. But we have waited with bated breath to know what happens with Jack West Jr. And the next instalment, at least here in Australia, is here. So can you give us a little bit of an insight into where you're taking us in this sixth instalment in the series without giving too much away, of course? Yeah, so um, uh, The Two Lost Mountains is the sixth book in the Jack West Jr. series that started with Seven Ancient Wonders. And we've been counting down now, Seven Ancient Wonders, Six Sacred Stones, Five Greatest Warriors, Four Legendary Kingdoms, Three Secret Cities, and now Two Lost Mountains. After I sort of uh, restarted the series with Four Legendary Kingdoms, I really was planning uh, four, three, two, one to really run to the finish. And so with Two Lost Mountains, we, we had Jack in Three Secret Cities uh, fulfill the trial of the cities. And in that book, we also learned there was another trial called the Trial of the Mountains. And this involves some things called the Five Iron Mountains, uh, two of which, the locations of which have been lost. And so they are the two lost mountains of the title. Uh, this is all building to the big final book. So there's a lot resting on Two Lost Mountains because it has to not only build up to the big, big finish of the seven book series, but it also has to stand on its own and really be a compelling story in and of itself. So as a book, it's going to take you to a few dark places and it's going to really ramp up the tension. So hopefully you're really keen to read the last book, the one something, something. Well, I can, I can tell you we've had a lot of questions about that last book, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Yeah. Now, in, in the two Lost Mountains, Jack and our heroes really could not catch a break. So yeah. Michelin has actually asked, how do you think of those crazy, mad situations that Jack and the team find themselves in? I, I enjoy it. And I've, I've been doing this now for 15 years, coming up with these crazy situations for Jack and the team. What I do is I actually draw them. Uh, and increasingly, as I've written the Jack West books, I sketch out these wild and amazing places. And again, I won't spoil it for those who haven't read the book, but in Two Lost Mountains, Jack and, and even the villain of the book have to perform this feat called the fall. And it involves a, a falling temple and they have to do something on it as it falls. It took me months to figure out the design of that temple and how it would work. And while it takes me months to come up with something like The Fall, hopefully when you read the book, it just reads like that. It reads like the most natural thing in the world. But uh, those who've read the book will know that the design of The Falling Temple, it's a very specific design. That took me months to figure out. And by the time I did, it did what I wanted to do in the story. So it takes me a lot of time. I love that you're actually sketching out the characters to really understand them, what their bodies would look like at the time, I guess their yeah. actions as well. Is that something you've always done? Yes. Even going back to the early books with, with Scarecrow and Mother in, in Ice Station in Area 7, uh, often drawing the characters, doing character biographies, and also drawing the scenes. So 
once I draw a space, then when I write the book, all I have to do is really describe my drawing. Mm. Uh, having the images in the books also helps too. And that goes all the way back to Ice Station as well. Ice Station had these very basic diagrams. Area 7 had the, the most wonderful, cute diagrams, which I did myself. They were always designed to be basic. But a picture tells a thousand words and a thousand words in a novel is three pages. So those diagrams really help me give you a really fast story. And that very much applies with the Jack West books because these underground or cavernous spaces have become more and more complex. That was going to be my next question that you've, you've already answered it was whether or not your images are in the book or whether you're, you then contract somebody else to recreate them. Oh, no. The, so in the early books, uh, going back but to Ice Station, Temple, all. Area 7. No, once we got into Seven Wonders, uh, my publisher, Macmillan, made the wise decision to hand my drawings to professionals who do them better. So I have a great artist named Gavin Tyrrell. Uh, he's done the, the images actually going back now for, gosh, half a dozen books. Uh, okay. Going back to maybe Great Zoo of China was, might have been the first one he did. Uh, so I make his life... Uh, torment uh, by giving him all these super complex diagrams and he has to make them look really professional it just makes our lives so much easier to visualize what you're trying to tell us though like it, it really adds to the book well it's it's my job I I really want I one of the things which I've always found ever since I was a published author way back when a lot of people have confused easy to read with easy to write mm. that just because a book is a fast-paced action thriller uh, and I've, I've sat in panels at writers' festivals where, where uh, moderators or other authors have said, oh, oh, that's just an action book. And it's like my, my job is to make it a really fast and enjoyable experience. And if the diagrams help with that, which I honestly believe they do, there will be more diagrams. Wait till you get to the one something something. I've come up with some of the most diabolical things I've ever created and, and I've drawn them and uh, they're going to be wild. I, I love that we're calling it the one something something. I, I note, noted that in your um, notes at the back of the book. <laughs> yes. um, I do, we do have some questions later. I think it's Chloe has actually said, can you please just call it the one something something? <laughs> just, <laughs> you know, shits and giggles. Can you just do it for us? <laughs> it's, it's, act, it's actually something which, which is, this is actually uh, to get an insight into my writing life. Um, I don't tell anybody the title of my next book until I deliver it uh, to Macmillan. And so usually I deliver in around January and my publisher, Kate Patterson at Macmillan, will receive an email from me and the title of the email will be The Two Lost Mountains by Matthew Riley. And that's when she discovers the title. And I think it actually is a credit to her and what a good publisher she is that she doesn't say, Matt, Matt, what's the title? What's the new book called? She knows that's the way I work. And for a certain amount of time, I'm the only person who knows about it. And again, if you could, I'm in my, I'm in this new house we've just moved into, but uh, just off screen right here is the pile of pages, which is the new book. So Ooh. See, what I want to know is, do you know what it's called yet? <gasps> Guys, that was an exclusive. Yeah, <laughs> that's an excuse. I do. I do. It has, okay. it has a title, but um, uh, nobody knows it except, well, yeah, it's just me. Uh, the baby's yet to be born. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, okay. so that's why it, and, and actually long-term readers know that even when I was writing, you know, uh, Four Legendary Kingdoms and I did a book tour for that, I said the next one was going to be called The Three Something Somethings. So yeah. we, uh, but uh, yeah, no, no, it does have a title and uh, I've, I've been working on it. Normally I do one book every two years, but I can't promise it yet, but I think we've got a pretty good chance that the one will come out next year. Oh, and we won't have to wait two years. So. That's so exciting. Do you know how many questions I've received leading up to this talk of when the next book is coming out? And do we have to wait another two years? And my heart of hearts, I was thinking, surely because of COVID, he started it earlier. I did. That's exactly right. Yes, I, we are there, I, guys. I, you will have it sooner. <laughs> I must say, um, The Two Lost Mountains actually came out on audio yesterday, so mm. in Australia at least. So I know um, I've got a lot of friends who are waiting for audio. 
Yes. So they haven't, full, they're into it as of today. They're um, busy listening to it. And again, we're not going to give anything away. It's okay. Um, now, Matthew has asked, how do you go about raising the stakes? So every, ob every obstacle they always had to sacrifice, how much more will Jack West Jr. have to sacrifice to win? Everything. Oh! It's, it's, it's going to get nasty. It's going to get nasty. And it's, it's, it's a complicated question because, I mean, you can look back at the whole Jack West Jr. series and say, well, in Seven Wonders, it was the fate of the world and then come Four Legendary Kingdoms. Well, uh, Seven Wonders was the fate of the world. Six Stones and Five Warriors was the fate of the solar system. Then we had a runaway galaxy in Four Legendary Kingdoms and now it's basically the whole universe collapsing. So the stakes have steadily risen. But to be perfectly honest, it means nothing if my readers don't care about Jack and Lily and Zoe and Albie and the team. And it's so funny that while I've increased the stakes throughout the series, the scenes that I find myself rereading and enjoying are the ones where I put Jack in these really mundane everyday circumstances where back in, I think it was Six Sacred Stones, he had a parent teacher meeting at the school that Lily and Albie went to. And, and in, in Two Lost Mountains, uh, we have a scene where, again, little spoiler, but not a, not a huge one. Uh, we have a scene where he, he remembers going to a careers day at, at Lily's school and, and teaches Lily a, a lesson uh, in the different parents who present to the, the students in the class. And we can have the fate of the universe or the fate of the world or the fate of the galaxy at stake. But if you don't care for those characters, it's entirely meaningless. And it's those little scenes which I think really make, uh, make people care about these characters and make you want to cheer for them. And unfortunately, Matthew Riley, having established in Scarecrow that nice characters can be killed in horrible, awful ways. Don't you'll know it. that no, you'll know that nobody's <laughs> safe. Don't do it. I have had so many requests come through to please do not kill off Jack and Zoe. That's, that's been the request. So. No promises. There are no Ooh. promises. It's a big, bad world out there. And uh, so two lost mountains is, is going to take him to the edge because it necessarily is the second last book. It's got to be dark for our, our heroes and our team, but it's going to get worse. Now, I am curious to know what drew you to adventure writing in the first place? Where did you find that inspiration and that, I guess, need to get it on paper? It's over my shoulders. Eh? If you can <laughs> see my room behind me here. I thought I've this is probably a given. <laughs> got Indiana Jones over this shoulder and you know, Django Fed and the Die Hard building over that one. And, and actually, there's the new Millennium Falcon from the Han Solo film there. And there's a reason uh, for that as well. As a kid, uh, I was born in 1974. So when I was at that pivotal age of like seven or eight, I was watching Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom Raiders. I loved the escape of adventure. And the Scarecrow books, I would call thrillers. Uh, now, I don't, quite I don't quite know what the difference between a thriller and an adventure book is, but the Jack West books are more adventure, uh, whereas the Scarecrow books, I would say, are more thriller. Uh, there's something more globetrotting about the Jack West books. And, and in many ways, with Indiana Jones here over my shoulder, Jack West was me wanting to see if I could create a world where there were ancient booby traps, which could be believable, and link them all to the strange and wonderful ancient places of the world. Now I mentioned that the Millennium Falcon there behind me, which is from the Han Solo movie, which I don't think this is an earth, earth shattering thing to say, is not exactly my favorite Star Wars show. I do like the Mandalorian a lot though, but with the Han Solo movie, what I liked about this Millennium Falcon was they added something to the front of the ship. And I'm always, the movie itself didn't do much for me, but I love seeing somebody reinvent a ship or an item from a story in a new and interesting way. And for that movie to show us that the Millennium Falcon may have looked different at a certain time in its life was really, to me, a great imaginative leap. Um, 
The other one I really liked over the years was when they did Superman as a Soviet superhero. I thought that was a really great imaginative reinvention. So that, that's why that Millennium Falcon now sits uh, on my counter behind my desk. Love it. Now, you are a bit of a collector. Now, I hear there's a DeLorean sitting in your garage. There, I, I live in Los Angeles. My DeLorean is living in Canberra in my friend's oh, garage. There you go. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's over here then. He, <laughs> we'll look after my, it for you. It's all good. My friend, uh, he took that grenade and he just promised to drive it every few days just to make sure it's okay. So just the DeLorean. The team. So, yeah, the DeLorean is still there. Love oh. the D. Are you missing I put, it? I, I post it. I post pictures of the D as those, those readers of mine tuning in tonight will know. I don't post a lot on social media, um, but when I do a post of the D uh, or the hand soloing carbonite, people love them. So, you know, I'll, I'll have to get some more shots of the D uh, when it. I'm back in, back in Australia next time. Absolutely. Oh, my, my dog has just walked into my Christmas tree. <laughs> hey. just, just the usual. Just, just a Wednesday night over here. Um, it's the so, COVID world. I know, right? Um, Oliver and Cheryl Lee have asked, how do you go about researching your books and how long do you spend researching each novel? Mm. Sorry, just having some M&Ms here. Well, before COVID, I used to travel and I used to love going to the places that I wrote about, especially for Jack West. Um, things like the Pyramids or Stonehenge or Easter Island, I was fortunate enough to go to them. Uh, in Two Lost Mountains, uh, there is a scene that takes place, again, little spoiler, but not a big one, at Mont Saint-Michel in northern France near the Normandy beaches and, um, and the Bayeux Tapestry is in the region of Mont Saint-Michel. And if you, if you haven't seen it, just Google Mont Saint-Michel. It's the most stupendous site you've ever seen. And when I visited it back in 2003 and I always thought, I'm going to put this in a book. And it's funny, I actually, I waited and I waited. And a lot of the stuff in the Jack West series coming into Three Secret Cities, Two Lost Mountains and The One are things that I've been keeping up my sleeve for many years. Uh, believe it or not, I've, I've kept some of the biggest ones for the Two Lost Mountains and The One. Uh, so the research now, obviously in this COVID time, I can't travel uh, as much. I have an enormous amount of books here in my home of mysterious ancient places, Atlas of the Ancient World, anything and everything about history. Uh, I read books about astronomy, physics, politics, uh, weapons. I watch documentaries on Henry VIII, which informed my book, The Tournament. So how do I research? Travel, nonfiction reading, documentaries, History Channel is fantastic. National Geographic Channel is fantastic. Uh, I'm a big lover of anything to do with saltwater crocodile documentaries. Um, everybody, anybody who read The Great Zoo of China would see all every single nature documentary I've ever watched went into those dragons in The Great Zoo of China. Uh, how long do I do? How long do I research for? Planning a book takes about three months. I, I don't write page one until I've done the planning and the research for about two or three months. Chance is another question because I was going to say, are you a planner or a pantser? I'm a planner. Always have been. Mm. Uh, I think for my kind of book where there's a lot of twists and turns and bad guys and girls revealing themselves, you need to know in advance that what's going to happen. Um, so I'm a big planner. Great. Now, Rhiannon has asked, when you're crafting your plot with historical themes and ideas, how mm. accurate do you try to be when filtering these themes and ideas into your story? Do you feel that mm. accuracy is critical in fiction or do you feel you can be flexible while maintaining the truth for the most fundamental of ideas? In other words, do you find it easy enough to bend your research to suit the plot? That is a very, very good question. And the answer is... I think it's more important to be factual now than it was 15, 20 years ago, particularly because people, I believe, are Googling as they read. We are. So if I'm going to write about Mont Saint-Michel and the history of Mont Saint-Michel, I assume that you readers will be checking it up. And so I think I might have been more fast and loose with the history for, say, Seven Ancient Wonders and Six Sacred Stones 
which were written in 2005 and 2007, than I would be now. When, when I came back to Four Legendary Kingdoms in 2016, I think the internet and smartphones had really evolved to a point where we now have these computers in our hands. And so I think more than ever, the historical elements in the Jack West books are probably 95% factual uh, and accurate. And, and I think readers will now assume that. And uh, hey, if you want to, you could take yourself on a tour of certain places like Venice or Mont Saint-Michel based on the books now, um, which I think is a good thing. As a addendum to that, uh, I'll give a brief reference to the tournament, uh, which is which sort of stands alone as a, an outlier of all of my books because the tournament is set in the 1500s and it's the one book where I actually have real historical figures, Michelangelo, Ignatius Loyola, Princess Elizabeth, Roger Ascom, even Henry VIII, actually speaking and doing things. And so with that book, I really made sure that it was historically accurate that they were that age at that time in that place. Uh, but once I got them into a room or there's a famous scene in the tournament where Roger Ascom, Michelangelo and Ignatius Loyola all have lunch together, I took that as my opportunity to put words into their mouths and that's kind of fun. And nobody's going to tell you what was said inside the rooms of ancient historical palaces, but we know where people were. Absolutely. Now, I am curious, I must say with that, you know, have you ever considered a career with Lonely Planet? Like if there was just, if there was going to be a spin-off Mark, Matthew Riley, could it be with Lonely Planet? Yes. Yeah. I, I, actually, I used Lonely Planets to, as a big source for Temple. Uh, to this day, I still have never travelled to Peru or Machu Picchu, which I'd love to do. Uh, so Lonely Planet books were, were fantastic uh, research tools for, for the writing of Temple. So, yeah, I, I could do Lonely Planet. Yeah, I, could, I can see that in your future. Um, now, I, am, I would really love you to share your publishing story with our audience tonight. And Jarris yes. has actually asked, if Pan Macmillan hadn't signed you, would you have continued to self-publish or just done something else? So for those playing at home, Contest, uh. you self-published. Yeah, so I, I wrote Contest. Uh, I was at law school. I was 19 going on 20. I wrote Contest, um, sent it to all the major publishers. They all rejected it. So I got a loan from the bank and printed a 1,000 copies and took it to bookstores. And I'd say, hi, my name is Matthew Riley. This is my book. Would you like to put it on the shelves? Uh, about two-thirds said yes. That was in 1996, late 96. And that was in the day when the manager of the bookstore was actually the manager of the bookstore. Mm. and could take a book and put it on the shelf. And Contest was discovered that way. And the interesting fact about that is when Kate Patterson from Macmillan bought Contest and, and called me, she said, what else are you working on? I'm not after someone who writes one book. I'm after someone who writes two, three or four. Often it's not the first one that pops. And so to answer the question, I was 50 pages into Ice Station at that time. And I had, as a planner, I'd mapped out Ice Station already. So I, I was going to write Ice Station as it was. So would I have self-published it again? Probably. Uh, could Ice Station have been discovered uh, by itself? I do believe myself Ice Station is a better book than Contest. Contest is that first book. You learn a lot with your first book and often it's the second book which is an improvement. And I think iStation was a bit of a quantum leap up in complexity on contest, but I couldn't have written it if I hadn't written contest. Um, when I look back on it, my discovery from self-publishing contest, it's the longest of long shots. Um, no other publisher ever called me. No one else ever got in touch. Uh, it was, and to Kate Patterson's eternal credit, she was a publisher who went to a bookstore to see what was out there. And a lot of publishers and, and even book reviewers sometimes get ensconced in their ivory towers and never actually go out to stores. Mm. So, I mean, you could say, you know, my discovery is like having two people riding horses in opposite directions, firing guns and having the bullets hit yeah. in midair. <laughs> but, man, I'm glad it happened. I mean, look at me now. 
<laughs> Look at me now, mom. An um, idiot like me can do it. Anybody can. So. <laughs> it's funny. What I love so much about our Frank Talk series is that every author I've spoken to has a different story. So yeah. it might be a self-publishing that was crowdfunded yeah. and that's how it was discovered or like yourself yeah. on a bookshelf. I think it really comes down to timing. Um, you can be rejected 500 times and go back to one of those publishers for the fourth time yeah. and it's the right time for them. Or they might have, a, you don't know what you don't know. So they might have a new publishing director. Mm. They might have a, a new commissioning editor whose job is to find new authors. That happened to me. I didn't know Macmillan was looking for new thriller authors. That's literally blind luck. Um, my favourite author when growing up was Michael Crichton. And Michael Crichton worked in books and Hollywood and television. And people always asked him, how do you get into the movie business? And he said, everybody finds their own way. Mm. And I think it's the same with publishing. Everybody finds their own way. Absolutely. Now, Julie's mine, actually mine, gonna... just, mine just, my way just involved abject failure to begin with. Now, was it Michael Crichton? Julie's sent me a question. Was it Michael Crichton who you were asked to complete one of his unpublished books? Yeah. Is that correct? And right. that didn't actually, it didn't, you didn't actually finish it, did you? Um, she's no, curious... I, was, I wasn't selected in the end. So they went with somebody else. Okay. She's curious to know which book it was. I am I'm actually contractually not allowed to say. <gasps> Damn it, I'm so sorry, Julie. I tried. But, <laughs> so, uh, no, thank, thank you for asking. Uh, it was such an honour to be asked. I mean, it's literally like being asked, uh, you know, to complete a work by your, your idol. Mm. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, it, it, I was not, I, I assume they went to however many other authors and I... I did my, my pitch of how I would do it and they went with someone else. So it was a very, very good experience. Um, and, and who knows? I'm, I'm pretty sure he left a few behind, so it could happen again. Oh, who knows? And what, what was it like to have those unpublished pages that really hadn't been read by the general public? Yeah, no, that, that's a very good question. Um, I, I know all about Michael Crichton. I've read everything he's done, even his nonfiction books. And so... I know his style, I know the cadence, the rhythms of his writing, and to read something which was clearly written by him, um, clearly written over several, many years, um, it was fascinating. Um, it, was, it was first draft stuff, and I know my first draft is not as polished as the final draft, but his first draft prose was, was right on the money. You could tell it was him. It was. It was ghostly to be able to read his prose. And uh, I felt really honoured. Oh, that's ama an amazing opportunity. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and one that could only have happened because I moved to Los Angeles. Mm. Um, a connection was made with the attorney of his estate. And so my name was put forward. You know, it's interesting. I have a, a friend and I have always said there are things that happen in America that would never happen anywhere else. It's, um, I mean, hey. In a good it, way. Well, that's exactly right. And the thing is Hollywood or, or Los Angeles is an industry town and the industry here is storytelling, uh, movies and television and to a lesser extent books as well. And so, yeah, if you're going to be asked to, you know, finish an unfinished Michael Crichton book, this is where you, you sort of, you could literally stumble into it. And it's the same in any other industry town in America, in other industries. If you want to go into Silicon Valley, hang out in San Francisco or um, San Jose, or if you want to go up into Boeing world, go up to Seattle or in fracking or drilling, go down to Texas. It's just that big. It's, a, it's an amazing place, the United States, just amazing. Absolutely. I remember turning a corner and there's, a, there's actually somebody watching tonight that was with me. And we turned a corner and it was the um, movie premiere of, I want to say, oh, it's gone out of my head now, but it was Bruce Willis. So we, we turned the corner and we got to meet Bruce Willis. So they, it just wouldn't happen in Melbourne, you know. <laughs> I, I, was, I was walking through the Westfield in Century City here and I saw Bruce Willis walking the other direction just with a baseball cap on. Yeah, no other place. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, good old LA. 
that's LA. That's what that's it, is. it. That's, that's right. it. Now tell me, um, obviously you're in a very different situation to us right now when it comes to COVID, um, yeah. being in LA. How has that situation impacted you? Andrew's actually asked if you found writing and creativity in general to be better or worse in 2020. How, how, mm. have, you, how have you fared? Now that's, that's a really good question, Andrew. Uh, initially better, then worse, now better again. Uh, when So I had four international trips cancelled uh, this year, uh, two of them book related, one vacation and one research. All of them were cancelled. Uh, when the first lockdown occurred, I thought, wonderful, I'm going to sit down and write, 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 and you know, get a head start on the one something, something, other projects as well. And for the first month, maybe six weeks, I went hell for leather, writing, 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 and I pretty much burned myself out. And what I realized is that certain things in my life provide buffers for me to rest between the writing. So when I say it was better to start with, it was worse in the middle because I then had to just stop. I just had to reset to say, hey, you can't rush it. And I realized that this COVID thing wasn't going to go away, Mm. you know, in three or four months. And so I needed to repace myself. And so I just took some time off and then realigned myself. And now I, I zoomed through writing the one something something. I finished the first draft of it. Uh, I have a movie project which I've been working on uh, in my time around that. And so now I've sort of figured my pace out. Um, it's not when, when the world stops and you're a writer, it doesn't mean you just now write 100% because then you just burn out. You need to, I had to find my pace again. But that's a, that's a very good question. Absolutely. And you actually released some short stories during this time as well. Yes. Um, that's, um, that was just something I figured it was nice to do. It's always nice to be able to put out the short stories for free. Uh, I wrote uh, the Roger Ascom one, Roger Ascom and the Dead Queen's Command, when I was touring uh, with the tournament years ago. Uh, I was just answering questions and talking to people about Elizabeth and Ascom. And so when I was in the hotel rooms traveling around Australia, I, I wrote that short story and I never really had a good moment to release it. And then when I thought everybody's at home and that was the full lockdown, I thought, why don't I put that out for, for nothing? And, and it was similar with the Jack West one, the Jack West and the Chinese splashdown. That was a short that I wrote, I think when I was on tour with four legendary kingdoms and again, I wasn't sure when there'd be a good time to release it. And again, that just seemed like a good time to polish it up and put it out there. And to Macmillan's eternal credit, uh, they helped me immensely with that. And, and they contact people like Apple or Amazon uh, and tell them, hey, we're going to put this out for free. And, and Apple and Amazon are really good sports about that too. Mm. Um, it's a bit harder for those people who read hard copy only, uh, but... I have had people come to book signings with the short stories printed out and they get me to sign the title page of those. And I love that. So oh, if you ever awesome. want to print them out, bring them to a book signing. I'll sign them. So. Oh, I love that. We'll have to do that. We will do that. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, now I will say Aaron and Rex, you're welcome. You are getting the book a lot earlier, the next book. Um, so we know we're not going to have to wait the full two years for that. Um, but Aaron would like to know, can you give us any clues on where to look for the Easter eggs hidden in the previous books that may pop up in the final book? So is there a chance, should we be going back and reading some of the, a specific book to give us, to remind us for the first, for the last book? That was Aaron. A very good question, Aaron. Aaron. Uh, Check out the Six Sacred Stones. There's so many things I put into the Six Sacred Stones which I'm still revealing now. Um, There is a mention in the Six Sacred Stones. It's not a major part of the one, but it's a character element. There was a mention in the Six Sacred Stones that Jack West had a sister uh, who who died at the age of 30. And there's a moment where Lily, when she was a small girl, said to Jack, you know, did you have any brothers or sisters? And he said, "I, I had a sister, but she died when she was 30. There are little bits in the Six Sacred Stones. Uh, In Four Legendary Kingdoms, there was a moment where Hades 
said uh, he was talking about the civilization that uh, you know bequeathed the the great the the four legendary kingdoms, the three secret cities, the two sacred trees. So some people thought that the two lost mountains might be called the two sacred trees, but I might have kept the two sacred trees up my sleeve. Is there only uh, one now? So, so there, there, there are sacred trees, and uh, uh, maybe uh, some sacred trees are found in two lost mountains, which will come back in the one. So look out for those little bits of, of dialogue in Six Sacred Stones and Four Legendary Kingdoms. Uh, and um, if you haven't yet read uh, Two Lost Mountains, uh, I would encourage anybody out there just to read the last four or five pages of Three Secret Cities because it'll, it'll get you primed for the, the, the pretty explosive opening of Two Lost Mountains. So just reacquaint yourself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Lil- Lily's fate was hanging in the balance at the end of uh, Three Secret Cities. Mm. So mm. we find out exactly what happens from page one, line one. Now, Philip would like to know, when you write Jack, does he have an Aussie accent in your imagination? Yes. Like, I mean, we are Australian, so you would think that when you're writing it, that's, that would be a natural it, thing. It actually, it, it, it does. And um, uh, I really love the fact that he is Australian, as opposed to my other sort of series hero, Scarecrow, who is a US Marine. It actually comes up, fun tidbit, in the editing of the books, but in the Australian and British editions of my books, when Jack says mum, it's spelt M-U-M, but in the US it's spelt M-O-M. So important. Yes. Yeah. It makes, yeah, I think it makes all the difference for the reader. It's that attention to detail. Yeah. Because mm. Jack doesn't say mum. No, doesn't. if he's Australian, his mom. it was his mum. So yeah. that's, that, that's a... So, yes, the answer is yes, he does have an Australian accent. And who would you get to play him in a movie? Or can I say potentially a TV series? Yes, so I I have sold the uh, television rights to the Jack West series uh, to a very big company here called Spyglass Media. So fingers crossed that this one gets made. Cross the Um, line. You know, I used to sell movie rights and now I sell television rights because we're now in this period where books become really great television shows. Um, As for who would play him, as I've discovered over the years, actors get old really quickly. So what I would say with Jack West is go to one of the Chris's. We could go with the Australian Chris Hemsworth. You could go Chris Evans, Chris Pine. Um, Any of the Chris's in Hollywood, uh, uh, Chris Pratt, you know, but again, I warn you, they just get old really quickly. And I think if we started with Seven Wonders, we really want to get a young 27, 30-year-old Jack for mm. that. Um, but sky's the limit now with movies and television sort of merging, the chances of getting a really good movie star to be in a TV show are possible now. Oh, much, much easier. Um, yeah. But tell me, how, how do you do justice to a Matthew Riley novel on the screen? Like, how does that happen? In today's, you know, yeah. luck, luckily special effects have caught up with me. And uh, when I was writing the early books, I station and, and some of the big screen, big scenes in Scarecrow where I blew up the aircraft carrier, um, that was just prohibitively expensive. But mm. special effects have now really come a long way. And uh, I think for an author like me, I, I owe a lot to Game of Thrones. And I think the Game of Thrones television show I mean, it was the most expensive television show ever produced. Uh, and so the special effects were of a movie quality. Mm. Uh, and now we're seeing shows like The Mandalorian or The Crown, which are also among the most expensive television shows ever made. But I think now the effects are there, that you can do things like some of the scenes from Seven Ancient Wonders with a hovering aeroplane above the Great Pyramid at Giza or, or maybe with Two Lost Mountains doing The Fall. This can now be done uh, for television at a at a price. So the effects are the effects are there now. But a television show like The Mandalorian, it can be upwards of ten million dollars an episode, probably more. Uh, and we love it. Yeah, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. Game of Thrones was astonishingly expensive mm. for its time, but it certainly paved the way. Yeah, think about that. 
what is it the the Battle of uh, Blackwattle Bay, the, yeah. the 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 boat scene where they had the green explosions and the flames going huge. That was movie quality. Yeah, yeah. absolutely agree with you. Now, getting away from the movies, well, maybe not getting away from the movie side of things. Simon would like to know when are we getting back to Scarecrow? Now, of course, everyone wants yeah. one the one something something first, but when are we getting back yeah. to Scarecrow? Yeah, so once I committed to doing four Legendary Kingdoms and then three, two, one, I really did have to finish the Jack West series. So Scarecrow is on my mind again. Uh, I do. I I may try to do a standalone before I go back to Scarecrow. Uh, just because when you're doing the series and you're doing the sequels, it's fun to return to the characters. And with Scarecrow especially, it's fun to return to Scarecrow mm-hmm. and the mother. Uh, but also I get a lot of joy and creative joy out of doing the standalones. So Scarecrow will return, but probably after I do a standalone book after the Jack West series, I'll, I am exhausted. I am officially exhausted. Uh, I, I've You've literally moved thrown- as well. <laughs> Oh, I, I have I have thrown every piece of historical, ancient historical and astronomical knowledge I have into the final Jack West book. There is nothing left uh, on the on the table. It's all there, uh, and so I think I need just a a standalone book just to try something different uh, for my own creative sanity. Now I do have a question from Daniel. Um, and I know Daniel's joining us from San Diego uh, tonight. Um, now, will we get to see a rematch between Prince Xavier and Jason Chaser in the near future? <laughs> um, I don't know if I'll do a sequel to Hover Car Racer. I, I have an idea for one. Um, Hover Car Racer, Contest and Temple exist in a... Uh, a, a uh, uh, a universe for me where I don't know if the sequel would be better than the first one. And the sequel has to be better than the first one to justify its existence. And I have a real soft spot for Hover Car Racer. It's got a lot of good sort of life lessons in it. And if I did a sequel, I think it would have to have equally good life lessons, have nice big fast races and photo finishes. The other thing about Hover Car Racer, if you'll permit me, is like Troll Mountain, Hover Car Racer is one of those books that a lot of people will read at a certain age. And, and then they grow into Contest and then they grow into Ice Station and then they move on. Uh, and so in that regard, Hover Car Racer sort of exists as a bit of a stepping stone book. Uh, so... I could do a sequel down the track, but it would have to it would have to be really good to justify doing it because I kind of like Hovercar as this book that a lot of younger readers will read certain books, jump onto Hovercar, realize they can read an adult length book, and then move into more adult fiction. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Now, Craig has asked, how do you decide who to kill off? And when is it only to drive the story or do you sometimes get sick of a character and just kill them off? No, no, I, I never get sick of the characters. That, that's not why I do it. It always has to drive the story. And as a general rule, if you're going to kill off a character, the death of that character has to reverberate through the rest of the story and reverberate through the other characters. So... When I did the notorious death scene from Scarecrow, uh, for which I still get hate mail 17 years later. You must have, you you wrote it well. (laughs) Well, that's my job. And the fact that I did that means that people love that character so much and felt the reverberation of that character's Mm. death uh, that it, it was worth it. You can't overplay that card though. If I killed off much-loved characters in every single book, then people would, they'd get on to me. So in that regard, I can't do it every time. I have to sort of pace myself and make sure that for in the Jack West books, again, going back so it's not a spoiler, say the death of Wizard. You know, that Wizard in the third book, he'd been there for a while. Um, Jack as a hero needed to move on 
without his mentor's help. Mm. And so that was a time for, for, for Wizard's death to come. Uh, so, no, I don't get sick of the characters. It has to have, a, what I use that phrase, that reverberation. Uh, and so, you know, as things will happen in, in Two Lost Mountains and in the one something something, uh, there will be deaths and they will reverberate. They have to. Mm. No, I agree. And Anthony has asked, who has been the hardest character death scene to write across all of your books? The one in the one something something. Oh, no, don't do it. <laughs> that's that. that that's it. it you would have come. To, okay. I, I, I still remember when I was writing Scarecrow, I, I had planned that death scene in the guillotine in Scarecrow. And it was always designed to take place in the exact middle of the book. And I remember writing the scene and I had the guillotine ready to come down and go chunk. And I sat up and stood up from my desk and said, can I do this? And I said, yes. You know, I said, Matthew, you've planned this, do it. And bang, I did it. And I, I still think that scene not only reverberated for the characters, it got me to, it enabled me to write that scene with Scarecrow and Mother, you know, fighting in the rain, which is still one of my favourite scenes in all of my books. But still fans are reading my books going, you know, this cold-hearted bastard did that in Scarecrow, you know, what's he going to do now? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, I mean, when you get to, with the Jack West series, when you get to the end of a seven-book series, the last book in particular, I mean, Two Lost Mountains is a tough, difficult book for, for Jack. And the one, it's, it's, the whole book is climax. It's the climax of these last four books and all seven books. And so it, it's got to be tough in certain places too. And I, I have to take not just my hero to the edge, but I have to take my readers to the edge. And mm. I think this is why we get on the roller coaster and hopefully why people come along to events like this and read my books because they want to see if I can take them to the edge. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of taking people to the edge, Lisa has asked, how did you come up with the liquid stone idea as a form of imprisonment? She's had nightmares about it. It's such a terrifying concept. I love the liquid stone. Um, no, I, I had the idea for the liquid stone with four legendary kingdoms. And then I figured out I could do really fun stuff with it. And again, I won't spoil it. In, in Two Lost Mountains, there is one of my favourite uses of the liquid stone. Uh, it's with Three Secret Cities, I got to really explore it and have it in these underground passages and chambers and, and guys getting in flooded chambers where they get embedded in the stone. Uh, but then when I got into Two Lost Mountains, I realised that Jack could figure out ways to use it. And I won't tell you where it is, but there is an escape moment uh, in the book, which is one of my favourite scenes using the liquid stone. Uh, I just, where it came from, I had been writing about all of these very large, often underground booby-trapped places and it occurred to me, how do you build it? How do you build all these places? And the notion that you might have this malleable liquid stone, which you could form into complex shapes, uh, came about. And so I got to introduce it in Four Legendary Kingdoms, but really use it in Three Secret Cities. And then I got to have fun with it in uh, Two Lost Mountains, and it does return in the one as well. I love it. Now, I do, I do have a question that I actually love from Julie. Is there a fiction book you'd wished you'd written? Oh. Because you are a big reader as well, yeah. aren't you? Yeah. I've never had that question before in my life. I think uh, you might have stumped him, Julie. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No. Um, so uh, obviously there's Michael Crichton books and Jurassic Park is obviously a favourite, but not one that I wish I'd written. The one that actually springs to mind is Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card, which, is a, which I think is a lovely book and a book about a gifted child going to this battle school, science fiction. Um, and if you haven't read Ender's Game, I would thoroughly recommend it. Um, I, didn't, I didn't read any of his other books. I didn't like the sequels. I'm 
but it, it's a it's a sweet book about a gifted kid and and often you'll find in my books there are a lot of gifted people Albie and Lily in the Jack West books and Bess and Askham in the tournament uh, the tournament is literally my ode to a sort of student teacher relationship so yeah Ender's Game Lawson's got card cool well, we've had so many people asking if Scarecrow will reappear in the final novel of the Jack West Jr. saga. I'm actually not sure that you want to give that away, but I'm just saying there are a lot of people asking for it. Uh, so the answer is maybe. Uh, the funny thing is I was very, very pleased to bring him in to Four Legendary Kingdoms. That really worked. But as a story, he also had to vacate the stage for Jack that the four legendary kingdoms is a Jack West book. So it was a, a special appearance from scarecrow. I was thrilled with six, three secret cities to have the explosive entry of Aloysius Knight, who fans hadn't seen since the book scarecrow in 2003. And, and he actually, uh, as those who've read two lost mountains will know, he actually does hang around in, Two Lost Mountains. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, Scarecrow does exist in the same world as Jack West. So mm-hmm. as as the impending end of the universe approaches, you know, he's probably amongst the people in the world. Although, as you will have seen in the start of the Two Lost Mountains, uh, there are siren bells going off. And if you're around when a siren bell goes off, uh, you're going to drop where you stand. Ooh. Maybe Scarecrow's asleep. Maybe. Now, tell me, Matt, we are, we are running out of time very quickly. What uh, is your advice to any aspiring authors who might be watching this tonight? Uh, write what you love. If you like action thrillers, write action thrillers. If you like romance, write romance. Readers can spot a fake in five seconds. Uh, and also... It takes a long time. It still takes me seven months just to write a first draft, a little over a year to write, to revise it and get the book into a presentable state. So know that it's going to take a long time. Uh, And beyond that, trust that you have the ability to do it. Everybody, every published author was a first time writer once and you might just enjoy it. I, 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 I call it a legal addiction, writing my books. I can't believe I get paid to do it. So write what you love, know it'll take a long time and trust that you're good enough. You know, you are. I completely agree. Now, one last question. What's your favourite style of cheesecake? That one's from me. (laughs) So here, one one of the greatest American inventions uh, is a restaurant chain called the Cheesecake Factory. Yes, it is. And, and so if there was no other reason for me to move to the United States, it was because the Cheesecake Factory is here and there is a Cheesecake Factory about a mile that way and there's a Cheesecake Factory a mile that way and I am slowly working my way through the entire cheesecake menu of the Cheesecake Factory. Uh, the current favourite is called the S'mores Galore Cheesecake, which is a chocolate cheesecake which has a graham cracker and a graham cracker base and melted marshmallow like a s'mores that you toast over a fire. So unfortunately these days when I have my s'mores chocolate cheesecakes, I do have to go to the gym now because (laughs) I'm not 22 anymore. And, you know, with the metabolism of a 22 year old cheesecake eating machine. Yeah. I will say when I am over there, you will find me in the green fields um, cheesecake factory in Nashville, Tennessee. So I may have frequented there a number of times. So <laughs> I, I, sh- I also I do good spaghetti. <laughs> the cheesecake factory is a very dependable chain of restaurants. You know what you're getting wherever mm-hmm. you are, and the cheesecakes are phenomenal. I should get a sponsorship from the cheesecake factory. If you're watching we, cheesecake factory, we should send them a letter. <laughs> I think. I think there's. I think if there's going to be any time to write a letter to somebody, it's going to be now um, and never ending supply of cheesecake. I think that sounds good. It, do, it does say that, I think, on my Twitter header or <laughs> Instagram. It says, Matthew Riley, 
international best-selling author, also likes cheesecake. Yeah, so that's maybe that where is, I got it from. That's, <laughs> that is true. I wrote that. So. Excellent. Now, Matthew, we, as I said earlier, we do have people joining us tonight from all around the globe. We have a whole bunch of students joining us from Sweetwater Union High District in San Diego, which I do love San Diego. And I know I'm sitting here in Melbourne right now, but you really can't go past some El Indio Mexican in San Diego. Um, and when I'm there, okay. you'll often find me um, looking after my shopping addition, addiction at Las Americas. Okay. So big fan, big fan. Um, we've also got people watching from India tonight, which they would like to know, you know, once COVID settled down a little Hello. bit under control, they'd love to see you do a tour of India. Um, yeah. That would be nice. I, um, I do get asked, I get asked that a lot. And that would usually be done through my UK publisher, Orion. But it is something that I would like to do. Yes. Wonderful. We've also got people from the UK and we've got people from right around Australia. I think I've seen every postcode possible um, for states and territories um, in Great. Australia leading up to this. So hello to everybody. We've got fellow library officers in with us. Yes, we noticed you when you registered. Um, and Matthew, your cousin Michelle also happens to be watching locally. So hi, Michelle. <laughs> hey, Michelle. Michelle, <laughs> yeah, Michelle's come to... Michelle lives in the Melbourne area, so she's come to uh, book signings in Melbourne in the past. Wonderful. Well, hello, thank hello you. to everybody tuning in from everywhere. I did one of these once and somebody wrote, somebody watched on a plane flying over the Indian Ocean. They had good Wi-Fi on the plane. Wow. So I'm, I'm glad when we, we do these things often, I've been to Frankston Library many times before, when you do these things, people come on the night, but... Doing it on Zoom is different, but it does allow people around the world to come along. So Absolutely. that is actually the nice consequence of it. So thank you for tuning in, whatever time it is in the UK. Uh, and obviously here in the States, it's just pushing midnight right now. And we are very thankful for your time. So Thanks. thank you so much for joining us tonight, Matthew. Ah, thank you for having me. It's always great to be back in Frankston. Wonderful. Thank you. Now, Matthew's novels are available to borrow via our BorrowBox app, which you can access for free with your Frankston City Libraries membership via our website. Or you can pop the physical books on reserve from collection for your, from your favourite libraries. If you're not a member, you can sign up via our website. You can also purchase The Two Lost Mountains from Robertson's Bookshop in Frankston via their online store. And Matthew, I'm pretty sure that's where you would have gone that time we were, we were talking off air about yeah. Bookshop, and I'm pretty sure it would have been Robertson's in the middle of Frankston. But keep an eye on the Frankston City Library's website for the great Frank Talks we have coming up. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's Frank Talk with Matthew Riley for Frankston City Libraries. Mm -hmm.